Okay, so the confidential on this last game. A game designed by Riddle Hides, if only you explore. Five pathways fully walked reveal a way to crash and score. So basically what this is, you've got five pathways. One, two, three, four, five. So I don't know how much of these, but we've got to click on everything. So I was going to bring these up anyway in the... Uh, <clears throat> yeah, make a video about all of these. So let's do it now. Arcade Origins. <clears throat> From its earliest days, Atari experimented with a variety of different takes on innovative leisure, arcade games, music, visualization, <clears throat> even holograms. Excuse my coughing, but it's winter. Oh, good lord. So I think I'm not going to read all these out because my voice is just. <laughs> it's not going to manage it. But, um, you know, just have a watch and um, if you want to pause it, you can do. Maybe the, the easiest way to do it. Looks like it just arrives and goes, take me to your leader. I don't want to hide captions and controls because they'll never get them back again. For some reason, I'm looking through the San Jose Mercury in the just random stuff section for sale. And I see world's first video game computer space. No price, just, just call. I'm like, wow, I'm pretty interested in this. So I called the guy. I said, so uh, you got a computer space? Yeah. He goes, yeah. First game ever. Okay, great. Um, what color is it? And he goes, well, what color do you want? I'm like, wow, this is getting very interesting because who has a whole bunch of computer spaces and who would know that they came in all these different colors? He goes, I've got a yellow, a, a solid blue, metal flake blue, and metal flake red. And he goes, a whole bunch of other games too. Okay, great, I uh, wanna come up and see him. These were in a Quonset hut on a sunflower seed farm off of Highway 80 in Dixon, California, halfway between, you know, the Bay Area and Sacramento. And these things hadn't been moved in, you know, probably since 1975. And so I got in touch with Nolan and showed him the pictures and scratched his head and then like a light bulb went off in his head. He goes, these were Ted Dabney's. These were Ted Dabney's units. This was his route. When he left, he took a route that we had, and he goes, this yellow one's the first one. He goes, I know it. That yellow one is the very first one. I kept the first one, which is a beautiful yellow computer space, and I kept Pong number 46, and we got the rest of them running and working as good as we could. We got it all for $5,000. I don't regret the purchase one bit, not for a minute. Well, cool. Uh, <clears throat> now you have to hide the caption there. I might be getting drowned out by the background noise, but I turned up the volume so that when it plays the video, you can um, hear the video properly. The arcades have been relegated to the back rooms and the side streets and uh, generally been an unsavory type of place. What we want to do is bring the amusement game to age. If we can give it a new zip and a pizzazz, it's going to be uh, financially successful as well as, I think, a very serious part in the leisure time activity of the American people. The marriage of traditional pinball machines and computer technology has resulted in the birth of a new breed of amusement games. And Nolan Bushnell is the man handing out the cigars.
Bushnell has developed two such games, Computer Space and Pong, and believes that they and others like them will move the pinball industry out of America's bus stations and bowling alleys and into the space age. In 1971, Bushnell invented Computer Space, but sold production rights to Nutting Associates of Mountain View, California, for royalties based on the number of games sold. It proved a good deal for both parties. Sales already exceed 1,500 machines. Computer space, like Pong, sells for around $1,000 and is played on the screen of a standard television set, which has been programmed to display the desired game. In computer space, the player controls a rocket ship, which is trying to shoot down enemy flying saucers while avoiding their missiles. If the player scores more hits than the enemy saucers, he gets one free play. By the time Bushnell invented Pong in 1972, he was able to form his own company, Syzygy Corporation in Santa Clara, California, to produce the game. He has already sold over a thousand machines and expects to sell 10,000 in the United States by the end of the year. Pong, as the name might indicate, is a game of video ping pong. The two players turn dials which control their electronic paddles and volley with an equally electronic ball. The first player to score 15 points wins. While Bushnell did design and program both his games, the technology he uses dates back to the late 1950s. Thanks to research by the Defense Department in the wake of Sputnik, Bushnell is now able to act out his dream of a nation inhabited by thousands of Pong and computer space games. The government spent millions of dollars to, on this technology, and as a result, now it's cheap enough that we can put it into a game and sell it for 25 cents for uh, a few minutes and, uh, and make a dollar at it. It's, a, um, it's something that the research and development really was, was done many years ago, and now it's cheap enough that uh, with PC boards and integrated circuits, we can use that technology to our advantage. The basic electronic unit of Bushnell's games is the integrated circuit. Each of these small chips is capable of storing large amounts of information. The program for a game is determined by specific combinations of these units to form a PC, or printed circuit board. The printed circuit board then tells the TV screen what to do. A single printed circuit board is all that is required to operate Pong, whereas 15 years ago it would have taken enough tubes and wiring to fill an average house. Bushnell first saw the commercial potential of video games in a game called Space War, which had been played at computer centers around the country for several years. We used to play uh, Space War a lot at the AI project at Stanford, which uh, was a big computer complex. And um, one day it just hit, you know, this is a lot of fun. You ought to be able to package it and sell it for a price. And, you know, one thing leads to another, and pretty soon, from doodling on a scratch pad, you're actually working out some basic block diagrams, and from there you think, boy, you know, it's going to work. Okay, cool. <clears throat> 1973 documentary. That's awesome. Syzygy. Notable and quotable. The genius of Atari was to create a fully formed commercial game that was designed for the masses and accessible to the masses. I'm probably getting drowned out by the, uh, the, the thing anyway, but <laughs> we'll go with it. So I'll just let you read that. Okay, so I've just checked the audio and you should be able to hear me fine. But uh, I'll try not to talk too much. Pong's a big one. game that launched an industry, Atari's founders asked engineer Al Acorn to create the game as a learning exercise, making its commercial success, commercial success a very happy and lucrative accident. The strong National Museum of Play inducted Pong into its World Video Game of Hall to fame in 2015. I didn't say I wasn't going to talk, but anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Just get me coughing out of the way before the video starts. As Al Acorn, the creator of Pong, discusses the design process of this iconic game and how its signature sound effects came from a lack of resources.
You know what the Atari motto is? Innovative leisure, right? Well, it didn't say innovative arcade games. It didn't say innovative video games. It said innovative leisure. It was broad from day one. I mean, Nolan always had a consumer game in his mind because that's what he hired me to do. And I wound up doing the wrong thing and making a hit coin-op game, right? When I was at Ampex, I learned how to make sync generators, synchronizing the basic fundamental uh, uh, circuit necessary to get a TV signal because we had to generate an analog signal. So you do that and you get the ball at one speed and you put paddles up and it's not, it's a very, very boring game. And uh, uh, so I had to, I added the speed up and I added the angles off of that just, you know, what to make it playable, interesting. And, uh, and so I eh, started getting a little interesting. That's cute. And Nolan said, well, it's got to have score. We had a pretty good game and hey, great. So what are you going to do for sound? He goes, sound, I'm already over budget. What am I going to do? Uh, uh, you know, so, well, I want the sound of a roar of a crowd of thousands applauding your win. And mm. Ted said, I want boos and hisses. And I'm thinking, how do I do that? Listen, I got video. I got the goddamn game up. Uh, now you wanted me to do this. I'll be right back. So I was pissed around for a day and poked around sounds that already existed in the vertical sync generator and gated them out with the 555 timer. I love it. Years later, the sound is so well thought out, so appropriate. It was like, are you kidding me? It was just, you know, just thrown together in, in spite of what the boss said. And so uh, that, that was how, that was how uh, Pong came to be. <clears throat> 25 cents per play, you don't get that in a, a Namco arcade where it's about two pound a throw. Pong doubles. <clears throat> I wonder if she fancies a game of Pong doubles. <laughs> Puppy Pong. <clears throat> pediatric, <laughs> pediatric offices. <laughs> I did not catch on and only had a small production run. Happy faces in your waiting room. The electronic video game everyone loves to play is now available <coughs> for waiting rooms in two exciting new designs. So it's regular and puppy. Now kids and adults too will want, will want to be early for their appointments. Oh, and then you go to the doctors now and all you get is like a reader's digest. I suppose that's counting. I've looked at everything, isn't it? Yeah. Just check before I move on. I don't want to get to the end and find I've missed one. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Oh, did I, did I play that one? Didn't play that one, did I? I missed that. Very nice. Yes. So, I've, yep, done all that. Done all that. Thank you. Let's move on. Legend of the Broken Pong Machine. So everybody's heard the Pong story. Probably everybody's heard the Pong story. But 
I've heard it many times, uh, and from Al Alcorn himself, who designed Pong. So, uh, the story I've heard is that they installed one of the first Pong machines in a tavern and let people play it um, as a test. Put it out into an arcade and see if it makes money. I mean, that's that's the market research. My understanding was Ted built a cabinet, uh, a, a tabletop, simple, simple cabinet, uh, over the weekend and uh, a coin mech bolted to the side of the cabinet tabletop type of big thing was sit on a barrel. Placing a interactive video machine somewhere and having people play it was still a relatively new concept. Nobody knew if it was gonna go. Oh, what is the name of the bar in Palo Alto? San Jose? No, it was Andy Capps. Uh, it was Santa Clara? Sunnyvale. So we, we'll put it in Andy Capps. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a coin op game, be it fragile and humble. Uh, and and so, so we did. Well, my memory is that he gets a phone call, the game's busted, which of course is the usual thing you get on a support line. It doesn't work. What is it and in what way does it not work? Well, it doesn't work. The bar owner or manager at the time kind of yelled at them and, and like accused them of their game being shoddy because it had already broken down and it was no longer functioning or working. And they get a call, you know, later on that night and like, hey, this thing broke, you know? <laughs> Come and, come and peek, pick up this piece of shit game and get it out of here. You know, this fucking thing broke. You know, I don't, I'm not gonna waste my time fixing this crap. But anyway, the machine, we got the word that it stopped working and I figured it could be anything. And I'd go out there and take a look at it. And uh, so I went to the, uh, went to the machine. Uh, and the first thing you do is you wanna try to play the game. Cause the machine was on in a tracked mode so there was, it was working, but you couldn't start a game. So you open up the coin, the coin box to basically flip the micro switch to give yourself a free game because I'm not going to waste a quarter, you know. And so they went down to see what's wrong with the machine to fix it. And what they found out was that it wasn't broken. It was just that so many people had played it, they'd filled the coin box with quarters, and it was jammed, and it couldn't take any more. So many people had played it that, you could, that it couldn't accept any more money. The game is broken because it's stuffed so full of quarters. <laughs> Completely <laughs> stuffed with quarters. It, and it was a small, I remember it was kind of small, if I remember it was a small space. It just filled up with the quarters and it, it wouldn't take it. When I opened up the coin mech, you know, all these quarters just gushed out. So, whoa, that's impressive. It's the equivalent of like crashing a server. When you launch a new website and it's so popular. So they crashed the server on Pong. And one of the other reasons it was also so popular is because you could play it with one hand while you're still holding a pint in your other hand. Um, and that also was one of those things that, you know, eventually many, many years later led to the rise of the fun barcades that we have, you know, and we can enjoy now. As Al will always say with a, with a little, you know, twinkle in his eye, he goes, this is a problem I can fix. Basically the way it worked was you take the money, the, the deal you have, and you split the take with the owner of the bar. And so I would, so I did that and I had this sack of quarters and the next day I come into work and I said, I got the machine fixed and here's the problem. Goddamn thing's making too much money. And no one, really? But it was, it was one of those great moments where something that uh, supposedly was failing was, was actually such a huge success that no one could recognize. It was truly the ugly duckling version of <laughs> technology. Because remember, no one thought I'm, he was like, this is just the placeholder until we get to design the really good game because who's going to play this stupid shit-ass game? They went on to produce all of these classic, memorable arcade titles for years that allowed the company to survive and, and be so much more than a one-hit wonder. So that's my understanding of the history of Pong. It's a great story, if it's true. <laughs> when a story is good, you know there's some doubt about it. Like, well, that's too good to be really true. It's probably a boring version of it that's actually true. Uh, you know, I, 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 it sounds, it sounds realistic to me. You know, I mean, uh, I've, you know, I've kind of seen that happen in my own. And, and when you do get a really great game, the coins will just overflow, and uh, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a cool feeling. <laughs> anyway, that's how that all happened. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. Space Race for Atari's second game. It went back to the space genre. Challenge two players to get their spaceship to the top of the screen first while dodging an asteroid field. Although well, space games would eventually be some tough burners at the arcade, Space Race was not a, a success.
Hopefully sort of like a dolly dealer kind of thing. <clears throat> Good TV 80s game show. I'm not going to read all that. You can pause it if you want and read that. Gotcha. The fourth game, a simple maze game in which one player attempted to catch the other. What made it controversial was the pink domes covering the joysticks, which were meant to resemble breasts. <laughs> God, I never saw that in the 80s. The game's risque flyer extended the metaphor. Ultimately, the domes were removed from the machines because of cost concerns. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, uh, costs, not the fact the man's grabbing the woman. Now, that would be deemed sexist if you did that. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to read all that, but... Um... You. Oh, touch me. Like Duncan Norvell, chase me, chase me. Atari Corner Operated Machine Touch Me was not a video game, but an electronic device. Oh, that's the one we played in another another video. It challenged a player to repeat an ever lengthening pattern of buttons. Yes, yeah, so Simon. Button presses. Ralph Fire, the inventor of the home gaming console, saw a Touch Me machine and was inspired to improve it to create oh, the iconic handheld game, Simon. Yeah. See some man putting his finger up to his face on the side of his head. Wow, that's just like a big arcade game. Mm. AC current drain, <laughs> two amps per hour. Wow, big big drain. <laughs> Key games. So I was successful in seventy three. It felt it was being held back. Uh, held back by the fact that coin operating machine distributors wanted exclusive agreements, so I created a competitor called Key Games. <clears throat> a separate company headed up by Joe Keenan that would sell similar machines to other distributors. The elimination was released by Atari's Quadrapong, for example, so sort of pretending to have competition. Hmm, that's a strange strategy. Tank! Tank Tank! No, it's only didn't last too long then. Let's just have a look. Hide. <laughs> Hide that bit. Water tank. First new entry in the tank series since '78. A four-player twist on the classic tank slash combat gameplay developed in 2022 by Digital Eclipse combines features from all tank games and even letting you play on ice. It says play. No, let's, we've, we've been there already. I've ticked the box, so yeah, let's um, <coughs> let's uh, move on. This is the CPUs. The arcade games like Tank and Pong were not software programs. It said they were built purely out of custom computer hardware mounted on massive motherboards. The 75 release of the incredible, incredibly affordable MOS 6502 processor meant that Atari and others could now program their games in software. <coughs> really pops. Home Pong. Mm. I can make enough Pongs in my home, thank you very much. Does look rather cool. We could do with we could do with the yeah, paddle controls for all the, the games in this collection that need them. Rrr, give me paddles. Sorry, pinball. <clears throat> it's 
Atari's pinball problem. Eugene Jarvis, who had gone to create video game hits like Defender, joined Atari in 77 to program the processors that controlled its new pinball games. What he found was a company that, in his view, was making all the wrong decisions about pinball design. I mean, Atari really, what, why were they in the pinball business? You know, here they had this tiger by the tail of video games, you know, just this supernova of uh, creativity and possibilities. And, you know, they were nailing it left and right, creating new genre, genres every other week. Why would you mess around with pinball? You could tell the um, our games were just not working, you know, and be, due to reliability, poor engineering, you know, thermal issues, um, issues of the games just falling apart, poor hardware design. You know, it just, I could see the writing was on the wall that, that we were going to go down. I mean, the pinball basic division was just a massive disaster. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, it was, it's, it's kind of the, um, uh, you know, kind of the hubris of, uh, you know, I guess Silicon Valley, uh, even in that era, you know, was like, oh, these, these morons in Chicago, they make these crappy old games, you know, like, you know, we're, we're going to redesign everything. We're going to put the display down in the bottom. We're going to, you know, put the boards, you know, underneath the play field so all the crap falls in and shorts out the things. And I mean, it was really horrific design and uh, they caught on fire. Um, the solenoids, they, they used this thing called rotary solenoids, which burned up and the screws fell out. And, you know, it was it was kind of a, you know, just a complete disaster as far as like design and also testing. And so there, there was uh, a lot of games that caught on fire in the early days. So, but I, they, they made a lot of money when they were working. You know, we did, I, I, you know, the programming was awesome because I did it, you know. <laughs> Atarians. Twenty seven inches wide rather than twenty inches. <clears throat> An extra <laughs> extra seven inches. Who uh, misses? Oh a lot of text. You just bring it up and scroll down, you can read it all. You can pause it and go back, etc. I'm 2000. <clears throat> A wider play field again for more scoring opportunities, more more ball action, need more bigger balls. Two clocks in the play field that advance bonus counters. Hmm. Very 70s inspired for something that's supposed to be in the year 2000. <clears throat> um, there's a lot to it. Avenger.
Unique tilt alarm sound alerts to the operator that the game is being abused. <clears throat> I need to go, help, help. Tilt is a pain in the uh, pinballs because they just, they just tilt at any opportunity. You're not actually doing anything wrong with them, they just go, tilt! You did nothing. more interesting than the actual Avengers. Well, the, the movie Avengers anyway. Hercules! Oh my god, the huge machine. Instead of the standard silver plimble plimbles, he used pool cue balls. Good god. I just got past the novelty factor though, it wasn't much fun. The last pinball machine Atari ever produced. God. Can you imagine? Just imagine the bouncing around inside, just. I imagine once it hits the, the lid, it's going to smack it and break it. Breakout! Famously designed by the Steves, Jobs and Wozniak. It's essentially a single player Pong. You know all about Breakout, I don't need to go into a description about that, but let's just uh, have a look at it. Hide those captions. Oh, those are the days. Let's see what it has to play. Oh, was that it? So I zoom in, it does that. If I play, it just does that. So it does. Oh. I thought it was going to be something else. Is it plus two? No, it goes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's filled itself in. Promotional flyer. The entire logo on the breakout flyer includes the company's original tagline, Innovative Leisure. No, get rid of that. Anti reflective hood. Zoom in there a bit, you can have a you can pause that and have a read of that in uh, full detail. New breakout, the new version. And I've already played that, so don't need to go into that. Clash of cultures. One Communications acquired Atari for $26 million at the time. The main reason for seeking a buy was it needed funding to produce its first game console interchangeable cartridges. Uh, I had the Atari VCS. And it was called the Atari VCS. It, it was never called the, the 2600 at the time. Maybe that was what it was sort of labelled as once um, 5200 came around and so on. I don't need to zoom him in, do I? One of the often, <clears throat> one of the most often heard things about Atari game design: the drugs profit involved. We put the question directly to the designers who were there. <clears throat> excuse me, and found that everyone's experience was quite different. Hmm.
you will hear stories of hot tubs in the lobby and drug use in the office. And I'm here to tell you that none of that happened in my department. We started smoking pot right in our office. Rob and I were like the premier pot, no, sorry Rob. Um, I and some other person who occasionally shared an office with me for five years at Atari, however that frickin' worked, we would just fire up right in the office. It's like, who knows why? It's like, this is like, it's illegal. It's like, it wasn't even a sense of privilege. It was just mindlessness. I worked in a satellite office. I started in 1977, which was still pretty early. It was only 18 months since the 2600 came out. Um, but there, were, there was no hot tub in the lobby of the office that I went to. There was no drug use in Atari, though I don't doubt that it was over where Howard and Todd Fry were working. Uh, drugs were consumed at Atari by all kinds of people at all levels of management from the bottom to the top and all over engineering. Not everybody did drugs, and, but uh, some people did and some people enjoyed them and some people abused them and some people went to the hospital on them. And, uh, but by and large, drugs were a relatively nominal uh, factor. Uh, drugs, you know, there was a lot of marijuana and it would participated a lot in brainstorming. So we had the way of, you know, trying to incorporate drugs into our productivity model. I went home and I smoked a joint, a little bit of cocaine and a little bit of psilocybin in it. And I was sitting there, it was about half gone when I realized, oh, you could do that. And it's like, I put it out and I went and I wrote a page of notes. And my design for that kernel was exactly what it ended up, ended up shipping. It was like, it was a tremendous amount of effort, actually, to get everything organized. You know, they, they did have good deliveries of cannabis in the inter-office mail. You know, that was, that was probably the primary use of those, those yellow manila envelopes. Um, so that, I think it was, you know, Fridays or Monday, I think it was Fridays when the, you get these really thick envelopes coming through the system. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You know, there, and it was weird. There was like there was a guy working there, and his his job was he was the weed dealer. You know, that was he didn't really that was his sole job at the whole company. And there was a very straight German VP of hardware down the hallway in the building. I have no idea. Um, and um, he complained to management about the smell of pot smoke in the corridors. So they got him an office in a different building. <laughs> I, I have been asthmatic since I've been 12. I, I need drugs to, to, to breathe. I did not do drugs, because drugs to me were something that let you get up in the morning, you know, and breathe. So I, and, and nor did I think I wanted to mix those things. I, I, the high of me was doing the work, and I was always a happy guy, so I just didn't need, I just didn't feel I needed it. So I never did drugs, but there were a lot there. Don't put too much stock in the fact that every Atari employee was stoned out of their minds while making games. I mean, there was all kinds of drugs consumed at Atari, but the, the real drug at Atari was going into a store and seeing your product, seeing your game on a shelf. <clears throat> Seem to remember the comic book. I'm not sure whether that was one I had though. I know it was a thing. Unless it was just sold in America, uh, no idea. It's a long time since I've actually had my uh, my original copies. The oh, Winnie Pops. It's a Sprint 8, so that's that's come up before in this. I think I played that in the arcade section. I can't remember now without going back through them all. that if you want to read it in full detail. Atari Video Music. Can we hooked up to a user stereo system and TV 
to display psychedelic visuals reminiscent of Atari VCS graphics. God, I'd love one of those. So the resonance of whatever music was playing. Hmm. I would love to see that. It's probably a YouTube video out there, but um, why can't they just show it in this? Unless I don't know. Nice. Um, yeah, nice uh, poster, but can't they just show an example of it working? Oh, hang on. Bug up. No. I better get to see the whole thing. That's a shame. I'll have to look up a video later. Fire truck, yeah, this came up in the um in the arcade section. And you can play the game in there. Yeah, they did a lot of that in those days. Make the game black and white, but just sort of put colour overlays on the thing to make it look like there was something. <clears throat> there was some colour in there, and it worked. It it kind of didn't really fool us, but it just we knew what was going on. But anything to just get away from straight straight old black and white. that in the um been going through the arcade games previously. Super breakout. And again you can play on here as well. Three games in one, although <clears throat> generally they're pretty much the same kind of game. And we need a, a paddle controller for this. I can't be doing with a analog stick for this. It just does not work at all. As I found out when trying to play the damn thing. Luna Lander. Authentically simulate an actual moon landing mission. Mm. Mm. Stretching the truth a little bit. Again, you can just pause it yourself if you want to read the whole thing in full. And of course, <laughs> vector sector. Touch me, can't you see I'm not afraid? In the Knickerbocker showroom. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> what a name. Knickerbocker showroom, but also just calling it Touch Me. Like Duncan Norbell, chase me, chase me. Ah, super breakout with um, paddle fish control. Probably be pretty good actually. Whoa, ooh, that's nice. We oh, hang on. Twiddle your knob. And of course, asteroids. Cocktail 
tables, horizontal ones. I do remember those back in the day, I tell you. thought about a cabaret <coughs> unit, just sort of compact, compact size. I suppose it makes it easier for various places to have it, but you tend more to get um, to the mid 80s, to get places having a, a cocktail Pac-Man unit. Well, there's a yeah, cocktail asteroid. But Pac-Man had more Obviously, I mean, this is the, the 70s rather than the 80s, but maybe we'll come to Pac-Man later. But um, yeah, the, the Pac I remember the Pac-Man cocktail tables, and they were ace. Oh, there we go. Missile Command or Muscle Command, as Tommy Tallywacker calls it. zoomed in so you can read the text a little bit easier, especially on a, a phone. That's all the screens into it, yeah. Displayed atop a custom hologram image. I've never even heard of this. Game graphics made up of simple LED lights, but the holograms provided a dynamic, realistic backdrop. And then it never released it. Oh, that looks ace. Maybe it's like sort of 3D chess, whatever it is in um, Star Wars. this 1980 81 that time frame prior to Ray Kassar's emergence I was part of the executive staff you know and Nolan Joe I Steve Bristow Gill uh, Dennis Groth fi finance you know we were all friends and no politics and all that and we all worked together and, and uh, part of the team that set it was, it was great once Ray took over, nope, it was all a closed office and he had his, he met with all his hires from Procter and Gamble and so I realized, okay, I'm out of this. I'm either going to have to quit because Nolan had gone, Joe had gone, uh, Lipkin, everybody had gone. Uh, I figured, well, I'll go back. This is my baby. I'm going to do it one more time. And I, we had used holography. We had, we couldn't keep secrets at Atari. We're just no good at it, so so uh, we decided the best thing to do was put out disinformation. So the, the one of the best ones was the well, next coin op game is going to have holography in it. Was like, what the hell is that? I knew what it was because having you know been to college and studied this physics and stuff. But that was just. But then anyway, I decided, well, I'll do something. Let's do something in holography. Maybe there's something there. I'll take it. Sounds sounds hard. Sounds interesting. I know a little bit about it. And uh, we proceeded to explore holography and what could be done, and uh, 
came up with a, with a holographic toy that basically sold it to Ray saying, how would you like, because the cartridge video game business seemed to be very good. How would you like to have a system where the cartridge, it's a cartridge based system, but the cartridges are half the cost of, everything is half the cost of the VCS. And, hey, go ahead. It were very simple. They were nothing more than a, an LED, uh, a, a simple LED game, the handheld LED game in those days. The only difference was we had a hologram with two images on it. You look through this box and there were two lamps inside and, and when you'd crash a spaceship, you'd see a hologram of a spaceship crashing. And, uh, but you could look through this half metalized mylar and, and play a, a space invader game or something like that. We did all the work, put everything together, got a chip designed, package designed, and, and at the end, Ray wouldn't. I mean, we even took it to the toy fair uh, or the consumer, we, and, and marketing wouldn't show it, wouldn't back it up, and we did it ourselves, engineering. And we sold, we think we sold 100,000 of them, but Ray wouldn't, would not release it, just wouldn't do it. And I realized that was it. Uh, they're not going to release that. I mean, this is now in a time when if it failed, you wouldn't even notice it. It wouldn't be a pimple on the balance sheet. And, but they were afraid to do it. Back when it would, the whole company was, we well, sure we'd do it. So that was the end of my career at Atari. <coughs> would have been so cool. Oh man, this is going to take a while, isn't it? <laughs> indeed <coughs> pew 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 shame the graphics were never quite like that but vector graphics were ace click on that didn't I? Yep. again something else we need the uh, uh, yeah, paddle for I'd rather these went through alpha, alphabetical order. That make more sense. I've no idea how many of these we've got to go through. <laughs> New game ideas. Again, just pause this if you want to read it in full. Yeah, there's no other images.
I'm tempted to have a look through, see how many we've got. Do, 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 do. Oh, good lord. Fancy to go through and then we get to the end. Where were we? Christ. <laughs> Tempest. Wandering Wilbur. <coughs> Pudgekin. <laughs> Weird. Whiff it. Strong trademark, strong smell. Present a coupon for one free play. If they did that sort of like a Namco arcade machine museum thing where they charge about two pound for a game, that'd be worth it. So they're not paying two pound for a frigging game or something. Never going to be worth it. You're the last rebel in a in a galaxy held hostage in a world. He's getting excited about his girlfriend playing Gravitar. I doubt it. I doubt that's what he's getting excited for. Mini bead. So just the same as centipede then. Big and long.
Fill your brain with bugs. Well, as long as it's the brain and not the, the house, that's okay. Oh, and they're still at it there. Centipede Deluxe. Uh, the most important feature to exploit the success. Exploit, that's a bit of a bit if you word. That worked today though, because they tried a female version of Ghostbusters that flopped. Then they planned to have a female version of Pirates of the Caribbean, and they ended up cancelling that. Yeah, so it um, needed better graphics, and it was just to just get the same graphics as. Centipede. It says, I fear staying with the graphics near Centipede style will yield disappointing sales, and it bloody well was. It was a disappointment. Who wrote that? Ed Log. Pushing back on the idea that a, a cute female centipede is <laughs> the objects to kill the centipede. Yeah, I suppose I can see that. I probably do like it better than Centipede because it's just more of the same but a bit faster. If you brought out Millipede first, you wouldn't be crying for Centipede to come about. Look at both of those. Yeah. Forget. Liberator. I think that was a game I had no chance of playing. It's a very dark colour, dark blue on a dark blue background. Hmm. That ain't gonna work. I know I've been going up and up from top to bottom on all the pictures, but it does look it does look wrong when I do that, doesn't it? <laughs> Sweet. 
could get through them all quicker if uh, there wasn't that much to click on. Breaking high score performances. I presume that's a different Atari age to the uh, the Facebook group. <laughs> Adventures are major havoc. Ah, uh, Firefox a laser, laser video game. <clears throat> I remember playing this in the arcade. It was a very fun game. In fact, a lot of the uh, laser disc games were very fun to play. The ones I did get to play, that is. I keep meaning to make a video about the arcade units I've got, which um, has a separate section for. It's got a lot of different um, computers or consoles in there emulated, but um, it's got one for a lot of laser disc games as well. I really should get that sorted out. I don't think I've seen the actual movie though. The, the um, Clint Eastwood movie. And I don't think I'd come across Coke and Dagger before playing it on this, but it's certainly one of the, the better games it had in the arcade section. Perhaps because I hadn't played it before. Quite a sort of. Um, a lot going on there with that sort of arcade board. Did we ever get the, the movie? Does not ring a bell. Let's just have a quick check. Just bear me one second. Talk amongst yourselves. Broken Dagger, IMDB. 
1984. A young boy and his imaginary friend end up on the run while in possession of a top secret spy gadget. So it came out August 1984. Not everywhere though. Probably, probably just like a straight to video thing if it ended up in the UK at all. Um, but the lead lad was played by Henry Thomas. I should check that out. both until you. <clears throat> oh, nearly at the end. The end of this section, anyway. I robot one of my all-time favourite arcade games of the 80s. The law, no jumping. If you, even if you've not played it before, if you can get into it, it's just wonderful fun. I still love it today. Doodle City is a bit um, worth a look, but I wouldn't get too excited. Continue. Well, Atari's origins from the video arcade. He also had created the first device that would be put video games on by extension computers into the millions of American homes. Read on to explore the history of the Atari VCS. So, I take it this is um, taking us on to the second section. So, we've done the 100% of that, and then we move on to Birth of the Console. <laughs> 